Hello, everyone. I'm so happy to be here virtually with you all to celebrate the 2024 Earth Festival. I'm Emily Weber, the Missouri State Rep for District 24, uh, Midtown Downtown area of KC. I'm also the Vice Chair of our caucus. I've served two terms in the House, and I'm currently running for my third term. So very quickly, a little bit about myself and how I got here. Uh, I'm adopted from South Korea and raised in rural Kansas. My dad owned his own small business, Weber Surge Dairy Equipment. So I grew up uh, around agriculture and was also a member of 4-H. What brought me to Kansas City was the Kansas City Art Institute. I was accepted and got a bachelor's in fine arts and graphic design. And I fell in love with the city and called it my home. I made a career in marketing and communications and worked for a variety of variety of companies in different industries. I've always been involved as an activist working in different organizations that aligned with what I believe in. One is our climate. It's it's Mother Earth. I'm a member and have served as the policy chair for Missouri with uh, Climate Action KC, which is a nonprofit that brings elected officials and community leaders together to reduce emissions, invigorate the economy, uh, promote public health, and improve the quality of life across the Kansas City region. After the 2016 election, I realized voting wasn't enough and I needed to work with candidates running for office that I believe in and organizations that help get candidates elected. I spent a lot of my time there. Uh, and then at some point I was asked to run and won my first election in 2020, making a little bit of history. Um, I became the first Asian American woman to be elected into the Missouri General Assembly. Since we're getting upon May, which is the AAPI Heritage Month, I thought I'd just throw that little tidbit in there. So currently in the House, I serve on a variety of committees. I, I serve on general laws, economic development, utilities, and I'm the ranking member on agriculture. So I know a lot of people are confused that an urban representative is the ranking member on Ag Committee, but I know that there are issues between the rural and urban reps thinking they don't understand each other. And I'm here to say, I, I understand both. And there are a lot of environmental issues that go through the agriculture committee. Some good, but some very bad. So I'll go into some of the legislation that is being pushed right now that has effects on our climate change. Um, we will start with a bad and end with a good so we can land on a positive note for our keynote speaker. There, there is a super majority in both chambers in Missouri right now. Um, a lot of what we have to do is play defense. There are attacks against renewable energy, and this could look like anywhere from trying to add more people on the Public Service Commission um, that are members of the agriculture industry to moving boundary lines where solar farms can be in certain rural counties, basically eliminating the presence of solar in rural areas. Uh, we have been very successful blocking these bills, but these bills keep coming back every single session. I know our keynote speaker has spoken about changes to our watershed and how that could result in two shortages to our food and water supply. So I picked a few pieces of legislation that is about Missouri water. Water is very sacred. Um, we must protect it. We have a bill that requires permits if you build a pipeline. This, this might not seem very important in protecting our water, but it is here in Missouri because this is actually going to require you to go through a process and a permit. Uh, right now, we have nothing. So uh, we have nothing in place and people can almost do what they want. We also have a very good bill that changes the Clean Water Commission back to what it was in 1972. I, I know going back to something uh, doesn't always sound good, but what our Clean Water Commission consisted of in 1972 was one person from ag, one person from mining, one person from wastewater, and then four public people with no relation to other categories. In 1972, when it was changed, it, it got slipped into a bill and no one noticed. Um, this change was due to a CAFO, a concentrated animal feeding operation, wanting to come into a rural area and got denied by the Clean Water Commission. So an elected official decided to push the legislation that would take away the four public people. So that's that's politics in a nutshell. Um, so this 
leads me to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. King, who actually spoke at Oxford University on Water Wars. Dr. King was commissioned into the Army in 1972 after completing his Bachelor's in Science in Chemical Engineering at Tennessee Technological University. In 1974, he completed his Master's in Science in Civil Engineering and entered active duty as a sanitary engineer in the Medical Service Corps. He earned his PhD in Environmental Engineering at the University of Tennessee in 1988. And then in 1991, he deployed as the officer in charge of the Southwest Asian Health Risk Assessment Team, which determined health risks to U.S. troops exposed to the smoke from the Kuwait oil fires and supported the rest restoration of Kuwait. In November 1991, he was elected to he was selected to be an academy professor and program director of the Environmental Engineering Program at the U.S. Military Academy. In 1998, Congress approved his presidential nomination to be the professor and head of the Department of Geo Geography and Environmental Engineering. Dr. King is a life member of the American Academy of Environmental Engineers, a longtime member of the Envi Environmental Engineering Professional Engineering Exam Committee of the National Council of Examiners of for Engineering and Surveying, and a founding member of the Global Mil Military Advisory Council on Climate Change. I am so happy to introduce to you all, Dr. King. Thank you so much for that, that wonderful introduction. I'm, I'm, I'm really, really pleased to be here. I have been working with Bob Grove for many years on uh, trying to inform and forward the discussion about the importance of climate change on the health of the, the health of our way of life and the health of uh, the whole earth. Uh, so from Emily's introduction, I'm going to jump in in 1993. What I'm going to do today is tell a story of how a, a guy who's an army guy, a career military officer of 36 years, uh, got into spending so much time and energy on an environmental issues, which we, which I call and which is referred to in academia as environmental security. Uh, what I'm also going to do is tell the story of the information that I have been gathering over the last uh, three to six months in the open media about the, the disasters that are befalling people right now and the potential for major disasters that are associated with water. Uh, and when I'm talking about water, I'm talking about fresh water, uh, water that is either in short supply or is becoming contaminated, unusable for uh, for normal domestic uses. And, and I'm going to talk about this on a world scale, and I'm going to talk about this uh, on problems and challenges that we face right here in the United States. And then I hope to tie this so that you understand how this is... Uh, from a defense and security uh, perspective, a threat to our national security if we do not deal with this uh, problem directly. It is related, directly related to climate change, but it pre-existed climate change as a major concern. Uh, I started writing about this in 1993, and in 1999, I published a little book that talked about the strategic implications of climate change. Uh, at that time, uh, climate change was one of the issues, but not the prevailing issue. Even in 1999, I was sure that water was going to be uh, a significant security risk around the world and could be a source of conflict, uh, had already been a source of conflict, actually, uh, in many places around the world. Uh, I always like to start with this slide. Uh, this slide actually came from the Kansas City Star in 2017. Uh, the United Dep States Department of Defense had just published a document they call their climate change roadmap of how the Department of Defense was going to have to respond to the environmental security threats that were posed by climate change. And I always thought it funny. I said, I'm the guy in the back there with the knuckles dragging and everything like that. Uh, but 
it was it represented real progress to me because from 1993 through uh, still uh, one of my major objectives was to make the defense and security folks the people who study and develop strategy for our united uh, for our uh, our defense make them understand that climate change is one of those threats we have to deal with just like the threats at our border right now, just like the threats from nuclear uh, proliferation and the other threats that are out there. I'm not saying it's the biggest. I'm not saying it's most critical at any one time, but it's one of the threats we have to do when we go through our national security analysis and build our national security strategy. And I think we've reached the point that we're seeing that going on now. Uh, now, the activity level and the accomplishments aren't as great as we'd like, but at least we have a recognition of that now. Like I said, I study this from the basis of environmental security. I didn't invent environmental security. It had been studied in academia for many uh, years. Uh, it was concentrated in the Ivy Leagues and in places like Oxford and Cambridge and in, in Europe and other places. Uh, but after studying it for a long time, this is what I have come up with in understanding uh, how environmental security becomes a, a defense and security issue. And it's that if we deny people in, a, in an area the ability to sustain their basic human needs, uh, that produces a series of reactions uh, that can become uh, threats to stability and threats to security, and even the sources of conflict. So what am I talking about in these uh, basic human needs? Now, you'll recognize if you look at my three bullets, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, uh, you recognize that uh, that's from our basic construction of our constitutional framework. That's what our forefathers thought was worth fighting for when we went to, uh, into conflict with England, what we were being denied. Uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I chose that approach to talking about it from, say, Maslow's hierarchy of human needs, which really says the same things. Uh, recognizing that until you have life-sustaining things, your, uh, your ability to have food, water, the absence of disease, basic energy needs, uh, some sense of safety, you don't move to the next level. That's what Maslow taught. You are at the level that you are able to uh, sustain for yourself. You don't start having a focus on the liberties and the pursuit of happiness until you have the life-sustaining conditions. Uh, if you really think about it, it's, it's almost like an Occam's razor problem. Uh, find the simplest answer and it's probably right. And, and that's what I finally came to after doing research in environmental security. Those places where they don't have water, uh, they don't have food, there's disease problems. Uh, those are the places that become insecure and the humans have to react in a way uh, that they try to achieve the things they don't have. And, and the choices forget to be very limited. Sometimes we describe it as you either have the flight or you fight to sustain or to obtain the things that, that you need to continue to survive. So providing life-sustaining condition is a basic human pursuit, pursuit, and that's what really defines environmental security. And if you're interested in the, in the, uh, the pictures that are there, those are from... Uh, my last visit to Afghanistan, which was 2006-2007, uh, uh, it, it exemplifies those places where those basic human needs are so, so cha challenging for people. So from a national security and, and a, a world peace perspective, the questions we have to ask is, where in the hierarchy of human need are most people today, or where are there places in the world where the people don't have or are not able to sustain their life 
uh, supporting conditions. What it, will it be like in 9 billion people are here in 2050? And I'm using a, a projection that says that the world population will uh, top out at about 10.4 billion people in 2100. That's if things don't change. But where are most of those people? And in my experience in 55 countries I've visited around the world as an army officer, the places that I went where we were doing humanitarian operations, uh, security operations, and rebuilding after conflict, the basic human need requirements were not being met. So this, this confirms my why question when I go out and visit places and go and deploy to different places where conflict or humanitarian operations are needed. I didn't invent environmental security, as I, I mentioned earlier. This is the one statement I have found that I think best uh, puts it all into, into, into words very succinctly. It's written by Norman Myers, who's one of the leading uh, researchers in environmental security. Uh, he was at Oxford University in the 1980s, and he published this in The Environmentalist. And this is from 1986. National security is not just about fighting forces and weaponry. It relates to watersheds, croplands, forests, genetic resources, climate. Even in 1986, I was considering climate as one of the factors in environmental security. Other factors that rarely figure in the minds of military experts and political leaders. Then there's another part of this from my perspective when I'm trying to be an advocate for environmental security inside the defense and security establishment when I take it into the Pentagon. And this comes from a man named B.H. Liddell Hart, who was a, a military strategist and historian from World War I era. And it really fits what I saw is in 1993 through 2000, I was talking about environmental security in the Pentagon. The only thing harder then getting a new idea into the military mind is getting an old one out. And that's kind of what, uh, env where environmental security rested inside the Defense Department uh, until mid-2000 and then on forward. Now we do understand the problems, but our reactions are not very strong. So the science of environmental security, uh, it's more than just climate change. Water is a scarce re resource for fresh waters and oceans. And in water, you remember there's two components. There's the amount of water that you need to grow your food, to do domestic requirements, to meet all the human needs for fresh water. Uh, and then there's the quality of the water. And in many places in the world, uh, water resources are being attacked in both ways. We have less quantity to meet than is, than is required, and we're polluting our water more and more, even though we've, even in the United States, we're polluting our water uh, more than before. Uh, I, I think Emily gave some of those indications in the work that they're doing in Missouri about the laws they need to protect the water. And, and lots of times it's, it's not about getting more water, it's keeping the water clean that you've already got. But it's also ocean pollution, as we're seeing more about. Uh, in air, climate change, uh, we're in an El Nino year, and we're seeing the impacts of that. Uh, and land use, the, all kinds of issues with land, particularly waste disposal as the, the human contribution to, to waste problem. When I, at university, I teach whole courses just on environmental security, and we certainly don't have time for that today. So what I have chosen to do is I want to work just with fresh water, looking at the quantity of fresh water in different places in the world and the quality of, of the water that's impacted by the, the pollution that's being introduced from man or human activities. And that's the way I'm going to use this to highlight environmental security as a defense and security issue. So I like to work with examples. I'm not going to go over this, but this 
the, the thing to take away from this is in the title. Climate change is irrefutable. The facts are the facts. There, there's nothing you can do about it. The measured data clearly shows the climate is changing. There, you can still question if you want whether it's human induced or whether it's natural change. And we all know it's both. Uh, humans are impacting and there are always and always have been natural changes. It is the sum of both. But as, as we'll see as we go along, the impact of humans is far outweighing uh, over the time periods we're looking at any impacts that the natural systems would have caused. This is an old uh, Western adage from the 1800s, whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting over. Uh, and that's what we're gonna be talking about. Uh, this is a, a picture from Mexico City and I'm gonna come back to this later, uh, uh, the dire problems that they're having in, in that population. But what I wanna do is first, I wanna use an example that shows uh, one that's, it has implications from climate change but this is occurring uh, not by climate change, but by political and, and human, human problems. This is the Nile River. The, the dark green shows basically the watershed of the Nile covering 11 different countries. Uh, the Nile is the critical resource in that part of the world. It goes from south to north, uh, from Uganda, exiting into the Mediterranean and Egypt. On the left side, you see the rainfall, where the water comes from that lands in the watershed, and it's determined by the geography. Uh, the middle of the, in Uganda, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Congo, those countries are tropical. And you go to the Sahara Desert in the, in the parts that is the Arab Republic of Egypt, Sudan, uh, parts of those are, are high desert, as you see. Ten, ten inches of lesser water is, ze is desert. Zero inches of water is hyper desert. And on the right, you see the flows. The, and flows in the, in the uh, Nile River are hard to determine. But the best we know, 140 billion cubic meters of water a year flows through the Nile River into the Mediterranean. By the time it gets to the Mediterranean, most of it has been used though. It's a very small flow that actually reaches the Mediterranean. And how that comes about is these are the countries that primarily use the water. And so what I have done is I've looked at the population when I first did this was 2011 and the total population served was 265 million people with conservative estimates of population growth in those countries, all of those countries have high, high population growth rates, more than 2% growth per year. That's a doubling every 30 years. By 2050, it's predicted that 700 million people will be served by the Nile River. And using demand figures right now, 171 billion cubic meters of water are used per year. So what that says is they're using more water than they have as a, as a normal flow, which means they're mining groundwater and finding other resources, maybe doing some recycling. But when you take this projected demand times the population in 2050, the demand will be 336 billion cubic meters way more than twice as much water that, that will ever be in the Nile. And climate change is impacting this by the overall impact expected to uh, the, the Nile is supposed to be less water in the future by maybe 10 to 20 billion cubic meters per year. Now think about this from the political standpoint. Uh, Egypt is critical to us. It has never been more at risk in the Middle East than it is right now, probably since the Egypt, I mean, since uh, Israel was created. If we cannot have sustained, uh, at least people will talk to us. I won't say they're our friends. They're not uh, aligned with the Western world. They're aligned with their neighbors. 
but we need the ability to be able to deal politically in that country. Egypt has been uh, one of those countries that has been supportive of us. If these countries are impacted by destabilizing effects caused by water, the political situation just gets worse. Speaking more directly about the conflict in Israel, Palestine now, one of the critical issues that they face is there's not enough water for the people that are there right now. So it's an it's a fight over land, but it's also a fight over water. Uh, if we had more water, we would probably have a better chance of getting to a, a, a solution that, that would be achievable and acceptable. But there is no more water for them. And the populations continue to grow. Palestine is a high growth rate place also. So here's another one that I use to show, and this is shows directly the impacts of climate change on a region that becomes a significant security uh, threat for the United States and for the whole world. Uh, this is obviously uh, Eastern Asia. 3.5 billion people live in the countries in this map. The things shown in the little boxes, uh, snow and ice, floods and droughts, sea level rise, extreme weather, precipitation change, and drying are all impacts that on this region caused by climate change. The very most significant is the loss of snow and ice cover in the Tibetan Plateau. That is the water resources that uh, survive, uh, that provide this, the seven major rivers that you see on this map, uh, the water that they need for those three and a half billion people. So we, we see the fragile conditions that would exist as climate change has changed the flow patterns of the snow and ice. Uh, the snow and ice pack is melting in the Tibetan Plateau. Rainfall, time, and the amounts are changing. Uh, drier in the summer, more wet in the spring, uh, which doesn't help for the, for the best conditions for the people. The overall drying requiring much more water to, per pound of food that you grow and water that's not available. That's the threats that are introduced by climate change in this region. But now as a military person, what I recognize is seven of the 15 biggest armies in the world or militaries in the world are represented on this map. Three of these countries are nuclear capable, have nuclear weapons at their disposal in their defense arsenal. Uh, and uh, just like our, our particular conflicts with China right now, many of these, because of the geography and the relations, uh, don't get along well. Chaos created by the lack of water, uh, the changing climate, uh, the humanitarian responses that are going to be more and more commonplace in places like Bangladesh and in the river valleys as they flood during the spring seasons and dry up uh, and have no fresh water during the dry seasons. Those kinds of instabilities added to the problems that are already there makes this a world scale uh, defense and security threat and certainly one that the United States cannot deny and, and cannot get away from. Uh, so, so the message I've tried to say, even if we ignore and we're going to go look at the security threats internally to the United States from climate change, the international threats uh, to destabilize and require our military action and our security action and affect our, affect our con economy. <coughs> All from climate change means that it has to be considered in our national security strategies. So what I want to do now is I'm going to, I, to, I told you I have been collecting data. Uh, you know, I go to Newsweek Time, uh, some of the technical publications like science, you know, all of that fake news stuff. 
And I have been collecting up data, looking at national and international kinds of issues. Uh, the one that's most commonly talked about in the United States right now are the challenges for the Colorado River. And so we're going to introduce and, and, and look at that in more detail. Uh, Colorado River provides water for 25 million Americans and probably su supports 40 million when you consider the overall impact of the food it grows, uh, the energy that it produces from hydroelectric power, and the other uses that the river provides. And that area of the world is, uh, the, of our country has suffered from a 20-year drought. That's why you see uh, Lake Mead as it is in this presentation, uh, drying up. So that's a picture from the dam at Lake Mead. Uh, the historic low for water in Lake Mead was 10,040 uh, mean sea level. And you can see from the draft, that drops us down to the very bottom of the depth of Lake Mead, almost down to the dead pool, which means that you can't get any energy out of it and you cannot discharge water from it. Uh, it's just a few feet away. Now we've had a tremendous amount of rain and snow and runoff uh, and it's brought the level back up to 1075. But notice that's 200 feet, almost 200 feet below full. That's billions and trillions of gallons of water that have been lost from Lake Mead. And even this massive amount of rain that we've had and snow hasn't been able, it made a, a very good improvement, but hasn't brought us anywhere near where they need to be to operate the dam. They're still uh, nearly 100 feet below where they need, meaning that this is still a critical shortage time for and threat to the 25 million people in California, Nevada, Arizona uh, that depend, and the people in Mexico that depend on the Colorado River for the water they drink, and particularly the water, the massive amounts of water you need to grow food. Yeah, got to go somewhere else. Texas is su suffering the same thing. The reservoirs and the water resources associated the Rio, Rio, Rio Grande Valley are at historic lows, and they haven't had the uh, the increase in flow in the last couple of years. They're still in extreme drought. Agro businesses are closing up in Texas because of the loss of water. Significant amount of ag acreage are coming out of uh, being farmed because there's just no water to put on the thing. This affects those people directly and affects everybody in the United States indirectly by the cost of food and the availability of food in those resources. It's a spiraling effect, a, a feedback mechanism of, of everybody being damaged because of this. And these are primarily driven by climate changes that have been made. They, they have rain, but it comes in large flooding amounts. And then during the growing season, it's drier. That's the the net result of the impact of climate change in that area of the country. One of the critical areas for food resources is all of the water in Colorado, in California, where we grow massive amounts of our food, the Imperial Valley, Joaquin Valleys. Uh, those have relied not primarily on groundwater resources over the years and the Republic River Basin in Colorado. All of those have been drying up over the last 20 years. Now, Lake Shasta is the primary source of water in the northern part of California. And the amount of water and snow they've gotten over the last two years has just about filled Lake Shasta up. But the problem with that is that's good. But the problem is if it comes, changes so rapidly from nearly dry to full in a couple of years, that means the use rates are really, really too high 
for Lake Shasta to be supporting the amount of agriculture and the populations that they've got. It, it should, lakes should have years and years of supply and it should not change so drastically. So the California has a, a reprieve, but it's a short reprieve because their storage capacity is really quite low compared to their needs. And then the ones I wanted to highlight from the most critical news and the scariest stuff I saw when I was going through uh, looking at recently published articles about water resources and water problems. It is predicted that based on the rate of flow they have now and the rate they're using the groundwater in Mexico City, and groundwater is 60% uh, of the water they have, that by August of this year, 25 million people who live in Mexico City will be without water. And there is no answer to replace it. There's no way for them to borrow water from somebody else. I favor it for Californians. Uh, there is no other resource there. If you don't have water, even dirty water, uh, there is no way to replace it. Uh, and I have seen no one that has proposed any answer. The answers is reduce, reduce, reduce the uses that you make, but that can only go so far, and particularly for such a huge population and such an isolated. It sits in a very, very deep bowl, but they have pulled their groundwater down hundreds of feet uh, to get to more to get to the water, and they're not exactly sure, but it's soon that they're going to run out. Think about where are 22 million people from Mexico going to go? That dwarfs the problems we're having right now when the South Americans and Central Americans are trying to come across the border. If suddenly Mexico City runs out of water, will that contribute to our border problems? It certainly will. I've been averaging over 100 articles a month when I examine the problems that are being spoken about in just the, the free press, the regular uh, things that you read, uh, the television shows, the online services have certainly got a massive amount about, about work. But they've identified 20 plus cities that are not at the state of Mexico City, but are in critical crisis mode because they just don't have enough water. Bogota, Colombia, is one that started washing water, uh, rationing water for the first time ever. Uh, this is an interesting one if you consider it because Bogota is located in a tropical region. Those are places that have ample amounts of, of water on a yearly basis from rainfall. To be tropical, you're at least 60 inches a year, but they are not able to collect and provide to the citizens of Bogota enough water and they're having to ration. And you see some of the other cities around the world that are being challenged. Beijing is challenged by water. Uh, and you can read many of the others. It's interesting to see Dubai there. Uh, if you've watched the news recently, Dubai almost went underwater because they had a massive rain event, one like they've never seen in the, any records of in history. Uh, the problem is they got a lot of rain and it flooded everything and then it went away because they don't have the capacity to store that. Uh, the rain did, didn't come in a nice incremental uh, regular flow so it could be collected and used. It drowned them and then it went away. The U.S. cities that are critical for water, Denver, San Diego, Phoenix, Baltimore, <clears throat> places you wouldn't expect. Sometimes it's the problem is they just can't deliver it fast enough because of like New York City and the old infrastructure that's available there. Uh, Los Angeles is always critical for water. So I started with a cartoon. I want to finish with a cartoon. Uh, what I want you to understand is twofold from here. First of all, Water is going to be a challenge around the world in our city. Uh, we are now looking at, for example, in Colorado, 
to use the water that they have in the eastern area of Colorado, they're going to have to pull at least 25,000 acres out of cultivation. That's the solution they've determined to balance the water demand for the water use out of the eastern range, uh, both the surface water and the groundwater, so that they, they get to a sustainable condition there. Whose 25,000 acres are not going to get the water? How do you, how do you implement that? Uh, I once spoke at the Kansas Environmental Conference, and one of the important speakers was the, was the woman that runs uh, water resources for the state of, of Kansas. And she said, uh, our ability to save our aquifer doesn't exist. What we can do is if we spend enough money, we could sustain the, the aquifer for another 15 years, but we probably don't have the money to do that. Western, uh, Western Kansas is running out of water to do the agriculture that, that we depend on for the food and they depend on for their livelihood. I spoke to the American Farmers Union in, in that part of the state and one of my best friends is the president out there. Uh, and they know climate change is real. They feel it because they can't do what they've always done and grow the food that they've always been able to produce and grow the same crops that they were able to do. They were some of my most interested audiences because they wanted, uh, they wanted to know what to do. They said they found me a little scary, but they understood that what I was talking about was real for them. But it's real throughout the world. This is this cartoon uh, is the one I always finish with because it, it's it's got a lot of sarcasm in them, and I use that, and it's got a tremendous amount of irony in it uh, to really understand. First of all, uh, the big guy in in his car and stuff in the developed world uh, producing the pollutants, but. We need that tree to protect us from the greenhouse effect is bad science. That's why I think that's kind of funny. Uh, it's culturally illiterate because of his understanding of, of Spanish. But the thing that's most significant about this, con uh, this cartoon and why I always finish with it is to show that this was presented in the San Jose uh, Mercury, the local newspaper in San, in, uh, San Jose, and it was presented in 1984. And I do not think we have made any significant progress to address the issue that it's introducing to us there. And we're still here uh, with some people that won't accept that climate change is real. And many of us that don't seem to be able to take the actions that we need to, to be able to start responding to it. And from the best I can analyze, the most direct security and an immediate security threat uh, is going to be from the impacts that it's having on water resources. And that's the message I wanted to share with you today. And I like to talk to folks if anybody wants to do some, uh, okay, uh, questions and answers. I just pulled up the, uh, the, the Q&A. So I'm gonna look at those real quick and go down through those. Uh, Dr. King, in your bio, it says you're founding member of the Global Military Advisory Council on Climate Change. What does that group do and who does it advise? That group consists of about 10 general, we were all general officers. It consisted and was president by a, uh, an air marshal from India. It included the former Secretary of Defense from Pakistan, a three-star general. Uh, it included officers and general officers from India from uh, Guyana, from the United States, from Britain. Uh, and our goal was, we started this thing in, in the early 1990s. Our goal was to go to our militaries and give, you, give them the same message I was giving to you. Environmental security is real. Climate change is gonna cause insecurity, instability in many places in the world. And the military are gonna be involved whether they like it or not and trying to find solutions, or we're going to be the people that have to go out and do the humanitarian responses and those kinds of activities. 
and it continues to go on. Uh, it's been well vested and it's strongly supported by the Euro European Union and the uh, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Uh, there are a couple of members from the United States, but that's the group and that was their original purpose. And it continues to advocate for uh, a whole government solution to the climate change price, uh, crisis with military participating as they as they should, but recognizing that the military are not primarily in charge. The military is in support of the Department of State, Departments of Energy, Departments of, of every part of government, the, the economics of climate change. All of that needs to be considered and the military needs to be at the table and needs to be putting it into our defense strategies. So that's for Norm. Marianne, answer asks, obvious to me water shortage causes human migration. Yes, ma'am, absolutely. Uh, why is it not emphatically stated by the media and the government sources? We, we walk tenderly across all of those things of, we call them environmental refugees, but actually proving that it was water or that it was uh, lack of ability to grow food. That's not abstract. You can you can connect the dots very, very clearly. But people want only things that are the big, big shock type things. And uh, the U United Nations in publishing their data is very, very careful to make sure you can say that this is triple, underline, irrefutable before they want to make statements even like that. What they will say, it's more than 90% likely that these people were displaced because of the drought uh, in the sub-Saharan area of, of Africa. And that's why the, Europe is having problems they're having. But absolutely stating it, why it doesn't get more public uh, uh, discussion, it, it's because the climate people have been more... Uh, I won't, I won't use, now I, I can't find another word. So I'll say honest about using the data and try to be more honest about using the data, more conservative about using the data. Was China's invade, invasion of Tibet water related? Uh, Bob Groves heard me talk. He probably heard me make the joke that I said that I don't think the Chinese have any problem at all with the Dalai Lama. They just want all his water. Uh, that part of the world is in serious conflict for water. China is building and diverting massive amounts of water that would go, have gone to Nepal, go to India, go to Pakistan, and diverting it for their own use because their western part of, the, of their country is very dry, and they need the agricultural resources to try to use the water. Uh, pick a place. Uh, Iraq, Syria those places that are in heavy conflict, 95% of their water comes from Turkey. Turkey is building dams to use that water for their own purpose. That part of the world's conflict is strongly related to water. How much, 50%, whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, water is a critical issue there and in many other places in the world. And I think the Tibetan Plateau, uh, Norm, you're, you're, you're directly on it. It is very heavily water related. Kate, let me see. Healthy soils retain more water. Can regenerative farm help to abate? Yes, yes, yes. One of the biggest uh, parts of the solution set that we come up with, Katie, is changes in methods in farming. Uh, we waste waste tremendous amounts of water. I, I used to go to Yuma Proving Ground where there's a lot of agriculture around there and there are aerial spraying water everywhere. Probably 20% of that actually hits the ground and does anything in the soil. There's massive amount of changes that we could make. How about that the greatest crop that we grow in America is lawns, grass. And we change those kind of uses and take that water and make better uses of it. The opportunities for better use of what we've got are, are everywhere, but Katie, the one you've hit is is probably the one that's going to save the folks in, in Kansas that I was familiar with. That was the, the solution set they were working on. How do we change our methodologies and how we use the water that we've got? 
and that's a worldwide issue. Diane, how does the military discuss these concerns with the Secretary of Agriculture and the EPA? Not well. Uh, I'll, I'll add a little to that, but one of the problems in our government is we tend to operate in stovepipes. Uh, Department of Agriculture, EPA, Department of Energy, uh, we need solutions that everybody contributes to and getting outside of our own stovepipes and spending some of our budget on something we think maybe ought to be somebody else's issue uh, is very difficult for any of the parts of our government. And I, and I think that's commonplace around the world. Uh, let somebody else do it. It's not my job, man. So that's a really, really good point, Diane. Uh, and the military is just as guilty as anybody else in being very uh, selfish in the in the way they uh, go about uh, doing these things that are whole of government solutions. We, we're just not. Uh, I wrote a paper not too long ago that they cried for developing a czar that has the power to put all of those people you're talking about, Diane, in the same room and make them work together. There has to be somebody that sits above them that can tell them what to do or it won't happen. Bob, you wanted to answer something. No, I'm just kind of marking the questions. So okay. Uh, oh, right. answered as we go. Is diverting Colorado River water to California affecting Mexico? Yes. We are now not meeting our uh, legal obligations to provide water to Mexico in the in the negotiations that we've done on the Rio Grande, on the Colorado River, uh, because the demands are so high and the waters have been less in the Colorado River for the last 20 years. It's a source of conflict, uh, not direct conflict now, but it, it is an issue that if it's left to, to unanswered, uh, can become a contentious between the two. It won't be any bigger than the border conflicts we're dealing with right now, uh, but it's it's something we're just not taking care of. I see the questions are gone. Anybody else got a question or want to throw one out or speak up? Uh, otherwise, I'm going to be turning this back over to Bob. Thank you very much, Bob, for the opportunity to visit with the folks today. Thanks to people for the questions. Uh, and... Uh, well, the, the answer that we all can do is we got to go out, we, we got to speak uh, with authority. We have to speak directly to these problems. We can't walk around them anymore. We can't ignore them. Uh, we have to stand up for ourselves and not get pushed around in, in dealing with those people that would still deny, still say, wait, we don't have, an, no, we don't. We don't know everything about climate change. We know a heck of a lot more than we did uh, before we started this research, but we know plenty to take positive actions that can help. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Bob. Great to see you again. Well, thank you, Dr. King. That was a very informative um, keynote. I really appreciate you taking time to be with us today. Yeah. Uh, we've got several um, groups with us today that's going to be talking about other events. We have events this afternoon and over the next two or three days as part of this festival. So we want to turn the mic over to them for a little bit and uh, Victor Doherty with the Temple Buddhist Center. You've got a big climate fair coming this afternoon. You want to talk about that? Thank you so much, Bob. And of course, also thank you to um, Dr. King and our, our keynote speaker. I really enjoyed that a um, lot. And, I, and I, I'm so grateful for the work that he's doing. That is really crucial. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Victor Doherty. I'm the director of the Temple Buddhist Center located inside of Unity Temple on the plaza. And today we're having from one to five, we're having our Earth Festival. And so we have over uh, 17 different organizations from all around the Kansas City area that are tabling, answering questions, providing workshops, presentations, um, and, and things like that. We've also got a, a, a panel forum at three o'clock uh, called Faith, Hope, and Action. It's a panel of various members of uh, different traditions coming together, talking about how uh, our different uh, spiritual traditions can also help 
in this ongoing concern around uh, taking care of, of our water, our planet, our air, our soil, and how, how you know, these traditions can help. So that's a wonderful panel we have at three o'clock today. Um, and so, and then tomorrow, Sunday for our service will be, uh, we have over a hundred local indigenous native trees that we're going to be giving away uh, after the service. So um, those kinds of activities are going on. Uh, we'll also be talking about um, the, the extensive solar panel system that we have at Unity Temple on the plaza and how that works, you know, showing there's an app that goes with it where we can uh, adjust and make adjustments and things like that. Um, and some of the other activities, uh, a big shout out to Jim McGraw, who is part of our Temple Green team, who's been helping, he, you know, he helps uh, pull together volunteers for recycling or changing light bulbs or even outreach. Uh, talking to folks around Kansas City uh, on this very, very important topic. So uh, again, uh, thank you so much to the Climate Council and to Bob, the keynotes and everybody for supporting us in, in our little corner of the world, trying to do the best we can to uh, bring these issues to the forefront and not just complain, but also try to provide uh, actionable items trying to provide methods and techniques for making a difference. You know, Dr. King spoke about people are always like, well, kind of not my job, or this is much bigger than I, so, you know, I'll let somebody else take care of it. And uh, I, cannot, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of doing the best you can uh, as an individual um, to either spread the word or to, to walk uh, the talk, so to speak, and doing little activities and things um, uh, with your community, your neighborhood, or even just your family uh, to bring sustainability and environmental concerns uh, to the forefront. So uh, thank you again, Bob. Uh, our, our event begins at 1 p.m. It's free and it ends at 5. And so it's a really a great way to bring the Kansas City community together around some of these really awesome uh, organizations um, that have been sprouting up over the past decade. So I think that's everything I have to share, Bob. Hey, thank you, Victor. Um, obviously, the fair this afternoon is great. At 1.30 at Unity Temple on the Plaza, um, I will be speaking, presenting the topic of prospering in a post-climate change world. Um, just echoing back what Victor said, we need action items. We need ways that we individually and personally can act to both make ourselves safer, prepare for the events. And um, I find that we can actually prosper. So many of the things we do to um, fight climate change actually create a healthier environment for us to live in, but they can also save us money. So I'll be talking to that this afternoon at 1.30 at Unity Temple on the Plaza. Um, Victor mentioned the um, panel at three, and that's actually being um, promoted and developed by Greater Kansas City Interfaith Council. So I'd like to turn this over to Ira and let us tell, let him tell us more about that event. Thanks, Bob. Um, and thanks to the uh, Climate Council um, of Greater Kansas City and to Victor and the uh, Temple um, um, Buddhist group to, for hosting the uh, climate uh, events today. Um, so my name is Ira Sirkar Harrod and I'm with, I'm the uh, Sufi a uh, representative on the Greater Kansas City Interfaith Council. And just a bit about the council, that uh, we're made up of about 22 uh, faith traditions um, that work to increase multi-faith understanding in the Kansas City area. Among our goals is to make the community more aware of the spiritual values that can help resolve issues related to the environment and the challenges facing society. And as um, Dr. King just outlined, oh, we have such, so much work to do, and it's so important that we mobilize all the different uh, sectors of society to do that. For people of faith um, and others, the, all the heat waves, the droughts, the wildfires, floods, um, storms, other extreme weather events, for me and for most of us leave no doubt that climate change caused by human action is, is disastrous, is impacting uh, 
lives all over the world. Almost all the world's faith traditions hold sacred humans' relationship with creation. Scriptures urge us to act on this relationship by caring for nature, by seeking God's, uh, by seeing God's grandeur and presence in creation, uh, by being thankful by the bounty that God uh, provides us, um, and and respond and um, connect with nature in other ways. Faith leaders and faith and members of faith communities are recognizing that their faith calls them to seek ways to help reverse the climate crisis and to take action. And so with these things in mind, the Interfaith Council has organized uh, a forum at three, uh, three o'clock this afternoon at Unity Temple uh, called Earth Day, Faith, Hope and Action. Um, and it'll take place in the Fillmore Chapel. Uh, the forum will begin with presentations by Buddhist, Catholic, and Native American faith tradition um, representatives sharing why and how their faiths call them to act and care for creation. The forum will also include brief overviews by a number of climate action groups working uh, for, um, uh, for change and small group discussions about how we can become more involved and deepen the climate action work of our faith communities and ourselves as individuals. Uh, the panel members include Nicole Esquibel, who is a, has been a practicing Buddhist for over 20 years and is a member of the Rime Center and has been on their board since uh, 2019. Uh, Brian Rowe, who is the environmental correspondent for the National Catholic Reporter, an independent uh, newspaper headquartered in Kansas City. He is the lead reporter for their Earthbeat and uh, na the National Catholic Reporter, um, Reporter's Reporting Project on Faith, Climate Change, and Environmental Justice. <clears throat> and Danelle Crawford McKenney, who is an enrolled member of the Sistan Wapitan Dakota Awate um, and a teaching elder in the Presbyterian Church. Danell has been taught many traditional traditions and values regarding Mother Earth and her teachings. She is currently she currently works at Haskell Indian Nations University, uh, working as a student rights specialist. So we in, invite you to come and join us, uh, share your faith uh, perspective on how to work for a. Uh, uh, climate um, resilience. You can register online uh, or just come on and join us. So thanks, thanks to the council again for uh, organizing these events and thank you, Bob. Thank you, Ira. Um, moving on to Sunday tomorrow, we have several events um, happening tomorrow um, at 11.30 a.m. at the Waldo Branch Library out on 75th. Um, I'll be talking about my new book. I just released a book called Unpacking the Plastics Pandemic. You know, there's there's so many climate issues, but really today we're we're starting to see plastics as a major player in the pollution and the toxic chemicals in our homes. Plastic is everywhere. So please join me at the Waldo Plaza Library to talk about unpacking the plastics pandemic at 2 p.m. tomorrow, Sunday. Is that correct? Yeah, 2 p.m. I want to make sure I'm getting the right numbers. Yes, 2 p.m. The Resilient Activist will be presenting an online webinar called How to Build Climate Conscious Habits. So you can join Sammy Aaron online. Um, that will be more of an interactive webinar where she'll be talking to people and, and talk about building climate conscious habits. So please join Sammy there. At 4 p.m. tomorrow, the Climate Hour will be hosting an online session called Climate Opinions. The Climate Hour is a nationally syndicated radio show, talk show. Um, it's on the Pacifica Radio Network and also an internationally recognized um, podcast. And they rank very well in Europe, Asia, and other countries. So if you would like to share your opinions on the climate, join the Climate Hour tomorrow at 4 p.m. online, and you'll be able to get you know record your opinions, and they'll use that in an upcoming show. Um, all of these registrations for online and local events, you can find those on the Climate Council's website 
Climate Council or climategkc.org. On Monday, and actually, you know, Earth Day, Monday, the 22nd, um, Missouri Organics is going to be holding a festival. And Sarah, would you like to tell us about that? Yeah, sure. Thank you for letting me speak today. Um, on Monday, on actual Earth Day, uh, Missouri Organic on 40 Highway, uh, right near the stadiums off of Manchester Trafficway, I will be having our first uh, Earth Day birthday celebration. So um, I believe it's 32 years of Missouri Organic being in the Kansas City community. Um, so we wanted to have a celebration. Um, it'll start at 6 p.m. And the idea is that um, our Earth advocates here have had their own tables where they've been learning the past few months about issues that they feel passionate about. So um, a couple of them will be doing about the great um, Pacific garbage patch and um, ocean pollution. Another one of them is doing how to reduce your waste and recycle properly. Another one of my uh, Earth advocates is doing a pollination station. So like um, seed bombs and planting little seeds. So a lot of stuff for kids and families to enjoy together. And then we also have a bunch of local nonprofits and local businesses that are going to be tabling and talking about their mission and their um, actions to be more sustainable in the community. So the idea is that you're going to learn and then you're going to learn how you can get involved in your community and then support. So supporting those businesses um, in any ways you can. And then we'll have Stan Slaughter um, singing about his compost songs he's going to be doing a little thing called uh field of heat so you can actually um feel the heat of compost so he's built this contraption i don't know how to specifically describe it but it looks cool outside um basically so like everyone can see the impact of compost um so yeah there's going to be ice cream um just a lot of different things to learn about and um Hopefully have a good time. So it'll be uh, 6 to 9 p.m. at our 40 Highway location. Thank you, Sarah. Um, thank you. So look forward to seeing everybody tonight. I want to thank our speakers uh, again, Emily Weber and Dr. King, for joining us for this um, forum. A um, lot of events coming up. I hope to see all of you this afternoon, 1 o'clock at Unity, for the um, tabling, the climate fair, and the presentations, events tomorrow online and at the Waldo Branch Library, and then Monday, come out to Missouri Organic. All the addresses, registration, Zoom links, that's all on the festival webpage at climategkc.org. Thank you.